Well, as we continue going through what Jesus teaches us about faith and his love for us with the words of the Lord's Prayer, you can open a Bible to our scripture reading, John chapter 4, or you can follow along in the bulletin. So this evening, we're at the part of the Lord's Prayer where I think, at first glance, we really like it. And then when we think about it for a little bit longer, it might not be our favorite part of the Lord's Prayer. Because we, as Lutherans, love what St. Paul says when he says, we preach Christ crucified, right? For the forgiveness of sins. How many of you think that's what it's all about, right? It is about Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his rising from the dead to give to you and me and everyone who believes in the forgiveness of all of our sins and the hope of eternal life. And we say yes and amen. amen. All right, oh good, you guys are catching on quick. But that's what we do, we, we love that part, right? We're like, yeah, that's, that's what it's all about, right? If I got up, because I trust that you all love the word of God enough, that if I got up on any service, whether it's a midweek service or a Sunday or a Good Friday, and I didn't tell you about Jesus, if I didn't tell you about forgiveness in his name and his death and resurrection, how many of you would be upset with me? All right, now let's be a little braver. How many of you would be upset with me enough to tell me? <laughs> yeah, some of you are direct enough. Some of us have more personalities of like, boy, I hope he's better next week. All right, <laughs> just gonna keep it on the inside. But we know this as a central truth to our faith. It is about Jesus and the forgiveness of sins. And in the Lord's Prayer, in the third petition, Jesus is saying, for the, for, Father, forgive us our sins, right? We're praying, we're asking God the Father, will you please forgive our sins? And I think we all love that part. Amazing promise of God. Oh, I'm going to the Father, and I'm praying to him, and I am free in Christ to ask him what? Forgive me my sins. You know, and I grew up hearing it as trespasses, and at other times we would sing it in church, it would be uh, debt, right? But we all kind of know that ultimately it's the same kind of idea that it, it's the wrong that I've done, either against God and his word or against my neighbor. Now here's the part that I struggle with as a human being, and I think many people do, including you, which is we say, forgive us our trespasses. That's not where we stop, right? There's a second half to that Bible verse. As we forgive those who what? Trespass against us. And that sounds like really fancy. Oh, they're trespassing against us. And when I was a little kid, I was super confused because I thought it was about property rules and everything. And I was like, why are we praying about property rules, and then eventually it was explained to me, no, what we're talking about is things that we do wrong against one another, things that people do wrong against us, right? And sometimes we translate it as debts, and so we say, please forgive us as we forgive our debt lords, which I think is beautiful language to describe how we often feel about people who have sinned against us. Think about it, anybody ever had a thought in your mind that when someone did something wrong against you, but then later on they were being nice or generous, right, they're trying to make it up to you, right? We even have that language, oh, they've gotta make it up to me. Make up what? Well, they're in my debt, right? Or sometimes we'll say, well, they're just doing that because they owe me. Anybody ever been guilty of that kind of mindset where, Right, that's why we say, they're in my debt <laughs> because they, they owe me. They need to make it up to me. And C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite theologians and authors, put it this way. He said, everybody loves forgiveness until they have to forgive somebody. We love that first half of the prayer. Father, forgive me my trespasses, forgive me my debts, forgive me what I owe you because I've gone and sinned against you. Forgive me my sins. And we would love the prayer just stopped right there or just went on to the next section, right? But then Jesus says, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that forgiveness 
that he does indeed give to us when we pray for it and ask for it. And I want you to bring it into the world. One of my favorite things about Jesus and the Lord's Prayer is that throughout his ministry, he lives it out perfectly. When Jesus says, here's how I want you to pray to his disciples and to you and me, and gives us the Lord's Prayer, there is no hypocrisy in his prayer. He lives it out perfectly. And one of the examples is our scripture reading this evening, the story of the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And there's about a million different sermons you could do about this one, but there's a couple of key things that I want us to see. Right, and so in the text, Jesus, and starting in verse five, goes to this town in Samaria. He goes to a well that was supposedly Jacob's well, and he asks a woman in the middle of the day, that's what the sixth hour means, to give him some water. Now, for those of you who might be a little unfamiliar with all the different types of people in the gospel stories, John kind of gives us a little bit of hints when he puts in parentheses, the Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. That's like the nicest possible way of putting the animosity that existed between these two peoples back then. Right? It wasn't just that, the, oh yeah, they don't have really have anything to do with each other and they kind of don't like each other, right? Like, so I grew up in Texas and Texas is still in me. I take it everywhere I go, okay? <laughs> but I grew up and the attitude in Texas is, Anybody that's from Oklahoma, you don't have anything to do with them, Mark. You're like, okay. And I never knew the reasoning, but it's just like, that's what you taught. If they're from Oklahoma, you don't like them, okay. Right? And my family was joked, you can go to any school you want as long as it's not OU. I'm like, okay. It seems weird and extreme, but that's the way it was, right? That's, that's like college football rivalry stuff, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? I'm sure Kansas folks have your own stuff, okay? where you're just like, we're being a little weird about this when you get down to it, okay? That's like John's like nice version of this. But the reality of it was not just, oh, they don't really have anything to do with them and all oh, this is friendly rivalry. It's we have nothing but animosity and contempt and hate for one another. And if you grew up as the disciples did, you were taught you don't go there, right? And many of the stories in the Gospels are about how they would walk around and take extra time and energy to avoid going there. So in the first place, they shouldn't even be there, according to the disciples' minds. They're kind of wondering, why did Jesus take us here? We've been told our whole lives, you don't go there, you don't interact with those people, you don't serve them, you don't talk to them, you don't love them. That's the animosity that is here, which is why the woman is so shocked. In verse seven, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And in verse nine, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? Because she knows, because she's been taught the opposite side, which is what? You don't go to Jerusalem. <laughs> You don't go to those people. You don't talk to them. You don't love them. So the whole world structure for these two people groups is hate one another. Always be against each other. Have nothing to do with each other. As, as John says in the parentheses, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. A, a factual statement was you could just reverse that say the Samaritans have no dealings with the Jews. The hate is reciprocated. And yet, what does Jesus do? He tells us in the holiest prayer, the Lord's prayer, here's how I want you to pray as my followers. Forgive me my trespasses, my debts, my sins, in the same way that I forgive others. And not just others, but the people that Oh me, the people that are in my debt, the people that have trespassed against my will, my feelings. And then what does Jesus do with his life? He goes to the very people that his people, the Jews, have said, 
you hate them, you don't go to them, you don't love them. And then he also takes his church, the disciples, along for the field trip, right? <laughs> Which I know it's not in here, but I guarantee you, based on other accounts that were James, in fact, is like, do you want us to call fire down on them? That the disciples were not thrilled with this field trip, okay? And they were probably wondering, maybe grumbling amongst themselves because they don't want to do it in front of Jesus, why are we going over to the Samaritans? We're not supposed to have anything to do with them. And yet what I love about Jesus is he says, well, I'm not just telling you to pray that way because it's a neat idea. I'm gonna show you what it looks like to live this truth out in the world. And so he begins talking to her and he says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the story that we just read, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this story, is it turns into a spiritual conversation about worshiping God and not about do you do it there in where Jacob's well was. And there are ancient uh, Samaritan temple ruins there to this day that archaeologists study. And, or do you do it in Jerusalem? Where's the right? He's talking about, no, it's about your heart. It's about knowing the truth of who God is through his Messiah and worshiping him faithfully. Because one of the things that they fought about <laughs> and divided themselves over as Jews and Samaritans was who's worshiping the right way. And we've never done that in modern day, right? But what were they doing? They were finding what? Just another way to tear each other down, right? to attack one another, to build oneself up by tearing down the other person and say, you're doing it wrong. And what does Jesus say? Well, I hate to burst your bubbles. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is, but eventually Jews and Samaritans are all gonna worship together in my name. Now, for us, we're like, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> but for them, guess what? That's a radical change of the world. Jesus is saying, actually, it's not gonna be about here in Samaria, it's not gonna be over here in Jerusalem. It's not gonna be about that style and that style. It's actually just gonna be about are you worshiping Jesus or not? So what he's telling them is, I'm here to bring forgiveness and salvation and truth to both the Jews and the Samaritans, both for you and your debtors and the people who have trespassed against you. See, when we talk about the forgiveness of sins, how many of you get real excited? Okay, a couple of you. The rest of you are like, I'm good. Okay, great. Um, hopefully by Easter, you'll get really excited for the forgiveness of sins, okay? <laughs> I'm assuming, though, you're just not showing the emotion because it's late, right? We're all tired from a nice dinner, okay. But, right? When we talk about Christianity, it, when we talk about Jesus, we talk about forgiveness, how many of us were like, yes, that's what it's all about. I am super excited about that. I love that truth. And here's why. Because it is true, and it is wonderful and good. And we're all a little selfish. Because we automatically go, it's for me. And we'll say it's for the world. Right? The, the nebulous world out there that hasn't trespassed against you or hurt you or sinned against you, right? All those, you're like, oh, it's for everybody. But it's really for me, right? John 3, 16, anybody know that one? Anybody familiar with it? Yeah, it's the gospel in a nutshell. God loves the whole world, Greek word is cosmos, the whole universe. And he sends Jesus to bring salvation, right? Here's the key thing. What I've experienced and know is that a lot of people go, oh, that's about me, <laughs> John 3, 16 is for me. And you know what? It absolutely is. And it's also for the whole world. But here's the real hard part. The whole world includes the people that have trespassed against you. The whole world includes your debtors. The whole world includes the people who have sinned against you or sometimes the hardest people to forgive are the ones that have hurt the people we love, right? Sometimes that's even harder. And then Jesus comes along and he says to this woman at the well, hey, you know, it's not really about if you worship in Samaria or Jerusalem. It's 
it's really if you worship me. What he's saying is, I came to be for the Jew and the Samaritan. I came to be for everyone. Jesus and his forgiveness and the salvation and the living water that he brings is for you. And it's also for the woman at the well. And it's also for the Jews and the Samaritans and everybody else. And this is what Jesus is teaching us in this story. I want you to ask God to forgive you your sins, and he will in the name of Christ. But then he lives for us the second half of that verse, which is, and I want you to be the kind of people who forgive others so that they can know who Jesus is and worship him. So when he comes and he tells her, it's, it's not about this location or that location, I'm actually surprising to her and to the disciples here for everybody. Now here's the other amazing thing about this story. Jesus in verse 16 tells her, go, call your husband and come here. And then we get to the very famous part of the story where we start to realize this woman probably has a very negative reputation in her community, right? So the reason she's coming to the well at the sixth hour in the middle of the day, most historians and scholars will tell us is because she was not welcome to go at the ordinary times during the day with all the other village women because they didn't want her around because of her life and her mistakes and her sins. They didn't want to forgive her trespasses. They didn't want to forgive the debts that she owed them. So she has to come on her own as Jesus, because he's God and knows all things, begins to ask her questions. The woman in verse 17 answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. Now, let's just think about this from a human level. There's a very, very, very good chance that she didn't want to actually have this conversation or answer that question, right? Because how many of you like awkward moments? Anybody? Anybody like being called out on your sin, especially in public? Show of hands, no, right? You're like, I don't wanna bring it up. I don't wanna talk about it. So what does she do? She does what many of us as people and humans do, which is you kind of tell a half truth to wiggle out of it, right? I don't have a husband. Let's move on to the next part of this game, right? And what does Jesus do? Verse 18, for you have had five husbands, and the implication here is not that they are five husbands because of death do us part but for probably various other reasons. And the one you now have is not your husband. So what you have said is true. Now just think about your sin for a moment. This is the the not happy part of the sermon. Think about your own sins for a moment. We, We do corporate confession and absolution, right? And I give you on Sundays oftentimes a moment where you can speak privately to God. But I have not met a human being that would, if I asked you to, come up here in front of everybody and say, why don't you tell us all your truths? I don't think I would get many volunteers to say, hey, why don't you come up and and, and open up your heart and tell us your deepest, darkest secrets? the things that keep you up at night, the sins that you haven't been able to let go or accept God's forgiveness for yet. See, this is a very hard verse, 18. Because Jesus is what? Right, he's not being nice in the sense of like, hey, you don't wanna shame somebody, hey, don't bring that up, right? Like if you knew this woman at a party and someone kind of brought it up, you would feel embarrassed for her, you would feel, oh my God, why would you do that? It is this bold-faced confrontation of her sin and her truth. And just think about that for a moment. We, we do confession, but it's personal, it's quiet. We're not shouting it out for everybody here because like this woman, we all have sins we'd rather people didn't know about. Right? 
We would rather they didn't hear about them or that we didn't have to get into the details of it, right? We just, I don't have a husband. Can we just move on? Everybody knows why. Let's not bring it up again. And Jesus says, oh, what you have said is true. And he's the one that actually fills in all the details, isn't he? He's the one that actually brings it up and says, here is the fullness and the weight of the truth of your sin and imperfections. Now, if the story simply stopped there, it would be incredibly soul crushing, right? Because if, I mean, if you just think about your own sins and then put yourself into the shoes of this woman and had Jesus, where you're just trying to like, you know, Jesus, um, not to get into the details or anything with you, not to really like belabor a point, I'm not perfect, right? That's, not a, that's like a confession of sins, but it's, y'all know what I'm talking about, but it's not a real confession of sins because you're not, you're not admitting what you did wrong. You're not laying it on the cross. You're just like, you know, Jesus, let's not get into the details here, but I'm not perfect. And then Jesus looks and he goes, what you say is true. You're not perfect. In fact, here's why you're not. Now, if it was me, I would not want to have that conversation. I'd be petrified of, well, what's he going to say next? What is he going to think of me? What is he going to do to me? He just laid out for me all of my grossness, all of my guilt, like all of my imperfections, and he did it with detail. What's gonna happen next? And here's what happens next for the woman. In verse 19, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, and so she knows that he is the Messiah, and God, she goes on and has this conversation about worship with Jesus. And in verse 25, the woman said to Jesus, I know the Messiah is coming. He is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, I started this sermon by quoting the Apostle Paul where he says, we preach Christ, the Messiah, crucified for the forgiveness of sins. So when you see the word Messiah in John's gospel, the word Christ, think of the gospel, right? Think of what that means when Jesus says, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah. What's he saying? Well, Paul tells us he's the one who has come to what? Be crucified died, be buried, and rise again for what? The forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. So think about it this way. Jesus is talking to her, and he asked the question because he knows where it's going to lead. Hey, why don't you go get your husband? It wasn't because Jesus didn't know. We know he knew the truth. Essentially, he's laying bare for her. Here's all of your secret sins. And like us, that would be so soul crushing if the conversation just stopped there. Yet at the end of the conversation, this is what Jesus says to her, but I'm the Messiah. Which means what? But, but I'm the one that will fulfill you. I'm the one that is here to give you life. I'm the one that has come to be crucified and to forgive you for all of your sins even for a Samaritan woman who's had five husbands and the one she has now is not her husband, even the Samaritan woman who has to go to the well on her own because nobody else wants to be around her because of the way she lives and what she's done wrong. And what does Jesus do? He stands right in front of her and says what? I'm the Christ. I am the Messiah for you. This is the good news for you and me. You and I, we're gonna, that's what confession is. It's standing there like the Samaritan woman before Jesus and going, here, here it is. Here, here's the truth and the reality of my imperfections and my sins and oh my goodness, am I ashamed of them? Oh my goodness, am I embarrassed about it? And oh my goodness, is it terrible and awful and gross and I wish nobody in the village ever finds out about it. And here's the good news for the Samaritan woman and for you and me. Jesus doesn't walk away from her. 
He doesn't like go, oh my gosh, you, you really are awful. And then get up and walk away from the well. What does Jesus do with her? He stands right in front of her, looks her in the eyes and says, and I'm the Christ. I am the Messiah here for you. And as we know what the Christ means, <clears throat> it means he is the one who is here for you, who died on a cross to forgive you all of those sins all the ones that you're carrying, all the ones that we're embarrassed of or ashamed of that we don't want anybody else to find out. Right? And then later on in this story, what happens is the woman goes back home. And she tells her village, <laughs> the village that wanted nothing to do with her, and says, <clears throat> here's her testimony. I found the Messiah. And their question is, how do you know? And her answer is, he told me everything I ever did. Think about that for a moment. How many of you have someone in your life that knows a lot about you? None? None of us? Okay, good. Like, I, I'm married, so my wife knows a lot about me, right? My mom and my brother know a lot about me. They don't know everything, right? Like, anybody have someone in your life that knows every single thing about you? I mean, you know, some of you are probably gonna argue with me afterwards and be like, well, it's pretty close. But in this context, think about it for a moment. <clears throat> when she shows up and tells her f village, friends and family and relatives, I met someone that told me everything about myself. What do you think she's hinting at? Oh, he, he knows everything, guys. <laughs> oh, right? Did you tell him about your five husbands? Did you tell him about your new guy that you have that's not your husband? And she's gonna say, what? Oh, he knew and told me everything about myself. And yet, guess what he doesn't do? He doesn't condemn her. He doesn't shame her. He doesn't destroy her. He doesn't walk away. He simply stands in front of her and says, and yet, I'm the Messiah here for you, here and now. And this is what happens. At the end of the story, the whole village comes to Jesus. And eventually, it's not just her testimony but it's the fact that he spent a few days with them. Which, by the way, I know it's like a, almost like a beautiful little fairy tale ending of like, oh, they all hung out with Jesus. Who's the they? More what? Samaritans. More people that have been told their whole lives, you guys are not supposed to love each other. And yet, what does Jesus do as an example for us and the disciples? He says, this is what it looks like in the world when you forgive your debtors and the people that owe you, and you forgive and love the people that have trespassed against you or trespassed against your family or did this thing a long time ago. Jesus has showed us that it's not just a line that we say in the Lord's Prayer, but if it becomes a truth that you and I live out, it will change the world. And how do I know that? Because one of the things we are awesome at as human beings, the Jews and Samaritans were real good at it, and even as Americans were real good at it, is dividing ourselves and forming teams that say, you're either for us or against us. You're either with them or you're with us, right? Anybody ever seen that in your lifetime? And you know what Jesus does? to the Jews and the Samaritans in this story. He goes, I don't really have a team. <laughs> I'm making my own team. We're gonna call it Team Jesus. And both the Jews and the Samaritans are invited to have forgiveness and salvation and to worship me together. It is such a different way of living in our world to walk around and say, you know, instead of holding guilt and shame and condemnation over my debtors, instead of destroying the trespassers in my life, I'm going to forgive them. And if you and I begin to do that, the whole world will change. Because that's what happened in the Samaritan village. That whole village did not love the Jews. <laughs> they were told their whole lives, you gotta hate them. And then Jesus shows up with a bunch of disciples who are Jewish, 
And he says, you know what? I'm going to form my own team where we're all together. See, this is a very, very practical reality and teaching for our day and age. You want to say, how do I live differently as a Christian in the world right now? How do I show people that I'm actually with Jesus and not on this team or that team? Well, one of the realities that you and I can do is obey the Lord's prayer and say, God, I want you to forgive me. But I also want you to forgive, and I want to be the kind of person like Jesus that forgives my debt doors and trespassers. And then watch the gospel change hearts and minds and lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you indeed are the Messiah who does not condemn or shame or walk away from us or any sinner. Yet instead you stand in front of us saying, I am the Messiah who was crucified, died, and raised for you so that you can have forgiveness and salvation. May we be people who rejoice in that good news each and every day. And may we be people who live like you and forgive like you so that all people will worship you and receive salvation. In your name we pray, amen.